I'm very happy this morning to be presenting Aero Architectural Number 23, Prefabs, The Future is Here Now. Our wonderful agent payment from Pasadena will do the actual introduction of Steve Glenn, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Living Homes, and he has a wonderful presentation that I think you're going to be very excited about. Prefabs are here, and they've actually you know, started over 100 years ago, maybe even before that. But it's remarkable with innovation and technology what a viable home it is today. And we're starting to see them cropping up even in our exclusive neighborhoods more and more. So with that, payment, where's payment? There it is. Payment is a wonderful uh, agent in our Pasadena office who organized this morning for us. So please give them a nice warm welcome.
quick background. Um, this is me as like a five and six year old. I used to have blocks and I would make cities and I had Legos and I made could, buildings. Could you speak into the microphone so we can really hear every word you say? Okay. Thank you. Is that much better? Okay. okay. Um, and I had a book on case study architects and uh, I wanted to be uh, an architect. I wanted to be friendly with it. That was the first, first guy I wanted to say, you know, I want to be like him. And I went to college and I discovered, first of all, that, that I had not even the talent or temperament to be an architect, unfortunately. Um, I also knew that he wasn't such a nice guy, so I said, all right, we're not going to do that kind of right. But um, I learned about this guy, this is Jim Rouse. Um, Rouse was the first developer to actually commercialize malls. That's Santa Monica Place 1.0 back in the day. It was uh, designed by uh, Frank Gehry, a long-time collaborator, collaborator with uh, Jim Rouse. Um, that's Faneuil Hall in the 70s. Uh, Rouse developed the whole concept of the festival marketplace. He did South Street Seaport in New York and Harvard Place in Baltimore. He also developed the first planned city in the U.S. It's Columbia, Maryland. And for you, those of you who are um, uh, new urbanism fans, he was doing things like walkable neighborhoods and um, uh, uh, homes organized around um, local schools and health facilities um, about a decade before celebration in Florida. In the 80s, he started what is still today the largest support of affordable housing uh, enterprise. He gave about a billion dollars a year in tax credits. So Ralph was, was very successful doing this. And oh, by the way, we're, we're in Hollywood, um, West Hollywood. Uh, so I, I should give a shout out to Ralph's grandson, Ed Norton Jr., who was actually born in. I'll be in Maryland, he's on the board of Enterprise. So studying Rouse in college, I, um, he kind of turned me on to, to a few things in the report. First, this concept of companies that successfully win profit and purpose. So it turns out Rouse was a, a, a deeply religious guy and he felt that it was his God-given responsibility to try to do good work with the work he was doing. Now, he never talked about the religious aspect to his employees, but he did talk about how the work they were doing was dramatically improving communities. Um, uh, for example, you may say, well, how, how did malls develop or how communities? Well, when Rouse was working initially on malls in the 50s, you had many GIs coming back from the war who were buying what was then affordable housing in the suburbs because that's where land was cheapest, that's where homes were cheapest. And Rouse felt like the suburbs needed some kind of town square, some, some sort of place where families could connect and, and, and play, and communicate, shop together. And he saw a mall as a next generation town square. It's an all weather town square. So um, he started developing malls, both because he saw an opportunity to make money, and he did very well, but also because he felt that it would be good for communities. Now in the 70s, when you had uh, many people in the middle class moving from uh, uh, downtowns to the suburbs, he became concerned about how can we develop city cores. So he came up with the idea of the Festival Marketplace, first in Boston, as a way to provide low-income jobs, to protect great architecturally significant buildings, to bring people back into the city's core, to redevelop areas. And in fact, Fenn Hall and Sesame Seaport and Harbor Place were very successful doing that. So what Rouse helped me to appreciate is that there are businesses who are integral in that which makes the business profitable or successful or sustainable, or things that also make it purposeful, but where each agenda kind of informs and enhances each other. And I realized when I was in college that I too wanted to add value through my work. I, mine is not based so much on religion, although there certainly is a spiritual component, but it's kind of a golden rule, just I felt like you know, do unto others as you expect people to do unto you, and like that's a scalable strategy. If everybody adds a little value, that'll be good for the planet. And I realized that there were teachers and people who worked in nonprofit and healthcare who did that directly every day via the work they did, but we're also going to appreciate that there are businesses that do that can do that too. So I said, I'm, I'm hopefully going to do that someday. He also helped me to appreciate that developers are more important than architects. Uh -huh. 
uh, developers hire architects or they don't, and they let them do great things or not. So if you actually care about the quality of the built environment, developers are the ones who really make those decisions. They said, I should become a developer someday. A, I have no talent to be an architect, at least a good one. B, um, developers are more important. And C, the world could use more responsible developers like Rouse. So that, that was the beginning. And I was a tech industry guy for a couple decades, but when I finally hungered down to focus on real estate, 2005, 2006, my thesis for business came very quickly. They said, they're, 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 ooh, sorry, this is, uh, I forgot, I mean, this, this is like my career, but that's for another presentation, but I took it out, okay. All right. Um, you, you just saw, by the way, um, 35 years of my professional life. Um, so um, when I finally decided to focus on real estate, my thesis for business, as I said, came very quickly. I, I said there, there seemed to be an increasing number of consumers who really value design. And I don't mean this just from a style mix, I mean form and functionality. So they're buying Michael Gray's products at, at Target, which were the best selling uh, uh, products at, at, at Target at the time, and, and Apple products. And they're buying uh, from Ikea, or maybe select pieces from Design with Reach. And they're, um, they're reading Dwell and Wired, and these consumers, and they're variously called the cultural creatives, also really value products that are built in a healthier, sustainable way. So they're driving Priuses and hybrids and, and buying organic cotton products in Patagonia and shopping at Whole Foods. But the problem is, these consumers, while they have many products, as they just alluded to, that address the great value they place on design, health, and sustainability, the production home builders, the KB Homes and Mars Pulte, Centex of the world, aren't building for these people. So I said, I'm going to start a company to build for cultural creatives. And I said, our strategy is going to be pretty simple. We're going to get world-class architects. We're going to integrate an extremely comprehensive environmental program. And we're going to use factory production or prefabrication to make our homes more efficient. Right? So we started with Ray Cathy. Ray is one of my favorite all-time architects, and, and, and you may know there's a, a set of coordinated ex exhibits happening right now called Pacific Standard Time at the Getty Coordinated. So there's Overdrive at the Getty, A. Quincy Jones at the Hammer, there's a few other exhibits. Um, you'll see a number of great Cathy um, homes at the Getty. And, and the Getty, by the way, acquired his archive. He's, I think, the only living architect whose archive they've acquired, along with John Lautner and Pierre Cody and some other. So what's cool about Ray is that while he's a modernist and his homes kind of read in all the ways that you expect, at least a California modernist, open floor plan and outdoor in, and kind of very linear, simple structures, he integrates a craftsman-like attention to detail and warmth. And while we freely admit that most people don't want modern homes, we think that the people who do want modern homes they're an underserved market, and they would prefer a warm modern home, even if they're not necessarily capable of articulating it as such, because modernism has sometimes, oftentimes, been defined by colder, more sterile spaces. Which may be fine for an art gallery, but not as good for a home. So Ray's a master of really um, uh, doing that. Uh, we also work with Karen Timberlake. They were the AIA from the year, a few years ago. They're out of Philadelphia. And then we also do our own designs. And so both from Ray and from Kieran Timberlake and Living Homes, we have lines of standard homes, which I will show you later. Let me talk about prefab um, uh, very quickly, because um, it, it is an industry term that really um, describes four sub-markets, but also four building systems. So I'm going to describe them moving from things that happen mostly in the factory things that happen mostly on site. So um, the biggest category, and the one people are mostly familiar with, are manufactured homes, or mobile homes. Now, they mobile homes are actually permitted by housing and urban development. And legally, cities can discriminate against mobile homes. They literally can say, this is only the place here in a mobile home park where you can do a mobile home. You can't do it any other place. In contrast, modular homes, Think 
Lego modular home is uh, big, big Lego pieces that get put together. They come in modules, big, big chunks. They have to conform a local building code. In California, they can't be discriminated against by municipalities or even by banks. In fact, there's nothing on the title that says it's a modular home. It's treated exactly the same as a site building home. Next category are panelized homes. So this is where pieces of the home, for example, a wall or maybe a, a ceiling come in, in a piece. So there's much more work on site. And then the last category, kit, that's where all the pieces are pre-cut. So there's much more work on site. So those are the four major categories under prefabrication. So when prefab works, and there are places where it's great and places where it's not. For example, the Pacific Design Center, you, you couldn't prefabricate. I mean, you could prefab pieces, but it's not like you could use a bunch of modules and do this. Because of the design, prefab doesn't like to do big, uh, uh, curvy services and, and, and um, uh, 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 all glass facades that would be very difficult to transport. So prefab is good for some situations and not, not so good for others. But when it works, you can get the following advantages. Um, first, major time savings. Because when you build on site, first you have to do all your site work. And only when you're done, can you frame it and put in your plumbing and your electrical and, and finish work. In prefab, as you're working on the site, you're building the home off-site. The building off site so that you can do things in, um, uh, 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 you can complete construction schedule much quicker. We're building homes in six months, three to six months that might take 12 to 18 months in Los Angeles. So we're really kind of cheating gravity there. You also can uh, reduce costs because we're often building in factories that pay much lower wages than you have to pay in Los Angeles. To, um, when you build on site, you're typically coordinating lots of subs, and so there's overhead and, and markup that each of those subs has, and management overhead. Whereas in the factory, it's all 95 folks who are scheduled. It's much more dependable. Um, uh, uh, you don't have to pay as much management overhead. So for all those reasons, it can be lower cost. Also, less waste. Um, the average site building home, maybe 30 to 40% of your materials end up in landfill. In fact, the biggest component, single component of landfills is construction waste versus what happens in a factory environment. You do shop drawings, you much more precisely measure the materials you need. And oh, by the way, because it's a central facility, you can store the materials and reuse them if need be. So um, that also saves costs, but also um, uh, important from an environmental standpoint, it reduces waste. You can get a higher quality home, and I know this may not sound um, intuitive when you think about mobile homes, but the state for modular homes makes you build to a higher building code. Because during transport, your modules are subjected to wind shear, vibration, like many earthquakes. So the state says the tolerances that are acceptable, the hardware gauge that you have to use is of a higher quality than the site built home. So those are um, uh, some of the advantages of prefab. So these are um, uh, some of our homes in various stages of undress. And I'm going to switch um, to the internet now, um, which will take a second. Grab some wires. And I'm going to show you a video of uh, one of our homes being assembled. I think the first one I'm going to show you uh, so, um, is a uh, home that we did first, oops, sorry, at the TED conference, and then we moved it to uh, Newport Beach, where it was installed uh, permanently there. So this is obviously a time lapse, but this took place in, the actual home installation took place in three and a half hours. And um, the home is ready to be viewed four days later. So this is a foundation that was done. Um, and then the home is comprised of four modules. It's about 2,000 square feet. All not only rough finish and plumbing, but 
uh, uh, electrical, but a finished plumbing and electrical. Uh, in fact, that's the kitchen module. The appliances are in the kitchen. All tile, grounding, all done, all windows. So in fact, the only work that has to be done are any materials that cross the mod line. So you can see the, um, the veneer there. It's a range between system. Obviously, where there are two mods that come together, that has to come on. Um, once the home is installed for flooring that crosses the mod line, that needs to be done on site. Electrical, utility hookups, then you're done. So um, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. So that was, uh, that home is now in New York Beach, and I'll show you pictures of it in a second. So this is the first home we did. Um, this is actually my home in Santa Monica. This was designed by Ricky Happy. And I think two things that we've done really well. Um, first of all, if you know Ray Cathy architecture, like this looks like a Ray Cathy home. But it was actually installed in eight and a half hours, and it's comprised of 11 modules. It's just a prefabricated home, but it looks like um, the great masterful work that Ray does. The other thing that's pretty cool is that this is the first home ever to be certified the platinum in, in, in the program's history. And for those of you who don't know Lee, I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later in more detail, but it's a green building certification program. And to get platinum at the highest level means that this home uses dramatically less energy and water and resources, and it's a much healthier indoor air environment than the average home. But yet you don't necessarily look at that and say, oh, that's a green home. Um, one of the big lessons learned, I think, from this is a home we did in Redwood. Um, one of the big lessons learned from the first energy crisis, which was in the 70s, there were lots of great green homes that were built in response, but they were underground, they were straw bale, they weren't homes that most people wanted to live in. And so we said, first and foremost, we have to create spaces that people really like, both from an aesthetic standpoint, but also from a functionality standpoint. That's that home at TED that I just showed you. Um, uh, uh, so, we said, first and foremost, we, we've got to solve that problem. But then, oh, by the way, we need to build them in a, in a, in a very responsible way. This is our first multifamily project. This is in San Francisco. It's the first lead plat multifamily in San Francisco. It's designed by Karen Timberlake. It's in the Presidio. It's actually the first building that's ever built in a modern vernacular in the, in the Presidio. There are rentals, and they're getting some of the highest rents in San Francisco. Actually. This is that home I showed you uh, earlier. I've done now a couple of these. This is in Newport Beach. This is the first lead platinum uh, uh, home in Newport Beach. We've done 12 platinum homes since, since which is um, more than almost any other design firm in the country. Uh, 
This is in Van Nuys, and there will be an open house of that home. Um, we just worked this out today, uh, June 23rd, 11 to 5. Um, I'm going to put information. I'm Steve at LivingHomes.net. You can register our, our site and get information about that. But this is uh, uh, the first production home designed to lead platinum level. Um, it's a really special space. And at Dwell on Design, June 21st through the 23rd, which is in two weeks, we're introducing the next generation version of it, which is this. It's got a, a super cool new window system from Western Windows that totally opens up the back. It's, 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 it's kind of the ultimate indoor outdoor home. It's very much based on the Eichler homes that A. Quincy Jones and others designed. So let me take a step back and, and, and talk about why one should care about ecological footprint. And, and um, uh, let me start by saying, if you look at the energy consumed in this country, all energy sources. Buildings consume more than anything else, so specifically the energy required to heat, cool, and light buildings is about 39% of the total energy production in the US. So that's more than industry, that's more than transport. If you look at electricity consumption, 71%, huge. So um, if we look at water use for CO2 emissions, well, 40% of the raw materials that are extracted on this planet are used to create buildings. So for those of us who care about climate change and who believe that we have um, a relatively short period to dramatically change the way we build products, the way we operate, the way we consume, otherwise there will be um, uh, increasingly irreversible and increasingly devastating damage to our environment, Buildings are the worst problems. The, the, the good news is, unlike some of the others, like creating low cost or long range electric cars or creating cellulosic uh, ethanol processes that don't compete with food stock, they're working on science in some of those other areas, but the technology, if you will, to dramatically reduce energy or water resource use to create better indoor air environments and buildings, it exists today. It's no more expensive than non sustainable materials. You can go to Home Depot and, and, and buy kind of everything you need. And what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is actually talk about these materials because it's what we do in our homes, but, but actually it, it's all applicable to what anybody can do in, in, in any building. I mentioned Lee, and I just wanted, for those of you may be less familiar, it is a green building certification program started by the uh, nonprofit United States Green Building Council in 2000. It's a point-based system, so you get points for things that reduce your energy or water use or uh, resource use or create better indoor air quality. And based on those points, you can get to be certified or silver or gold or platinum. And there are different lead programs for different things, corn, shell, homes, uh, interior, uh, commercial materials. And I just know they parked in the West Hollywood Library, which, by the way, used to tip free for two hours as opposed to this place. Um, uh, is a lead goal certified building. So that would be the new construction, the NC, uh, new construction. Oh, and one other point, um, actually, this is very relevant for you guys. Um, UCLA Berkeley Business School did a study last year and found that green certified homes, mostly lead, but lead's not the only one, it's the biggest one in California are selling for 9% more than non-certified homes. So people who may say, hey, you know, does it make sense to get a green home or certified? Yes, actually, they're selling for more. There's been good data in the commercial space for years. The LEED program was started in the commercial space, so there's been much more, um, it's a much longer program. Um, but in the commercial space, LEED certified buildings are selling for more, renting for more, lower turnover, um, now, there's increasing data that is finding the same thing in the home space. People are paying more for a lead certified or green certified home. Um, and just, we did some research just to show that um, as you get higher levels of lead certification, your water years, resource use, your, your uh, energy use is going down dramatically. And that's the point, right? not the certification per se, but the, the, 
the actual impact on resources. So we use lead to give consumers an objective third-party measure of what we're doing versus others. But internally, we developed this program called Z6 because we are really focused on trying to create homes that have ultimately positive impact on the environment, but certainly initially less negative impact. So with our program, it really identifies the key things we're trying to do. Namely, we, we try to, most of the homes we design are zero energy, to tell you what that means, zero water. Uh, we try to, to get as close to zero emissions as possible, zero carbon, zero waste, and zero ignorance. So I'm going to tell you about each of these. Energy is the most important category to get right, period. A building will use far more energy over its life of 30, 40, 50, 100 years than is embodied in the materials used to create that building. So the most important category, as I said, to really focus on is energy use. And there are really two parts to the problem. The first part is to make the building as energy efficient as possible, to reduce the energy it needs. So you do that several ways. Number one, insulate it. So we use two, three times the amount of insulation that code calls for in our buildings. We like a bloated, cellulosic material, so it's, it's made out of um, old newspaper. Uh, it's bloated, so it fills in every, every nook and cranny. We like to use LED lights, 90 million diodes. We use a tenth of the power of incandescent and a demo hole, and there's no number for it. We um, uh, use only Energy Star certified appliances. Uh, we like to use radiant heating where we can, which is hot water that circulates under the floors because we can preheat it with solar tubes, getting less energy. So all of these things allow us to reduce the energy we need, and then we, we have photovoltaics for solar panels to provide the energy we need. Solar panels. Uh, water, hugely important um, in, in more and more of the nation because, uh, again, climate change, dry areas are getting drier. And uh, so all of our uh, light energy, there are two parts of the problem. One, reduce what you need, and then two, reclaim ideally what you need for at least irrigation. So we encourage our plants to do drought, drought tolerant native landscape. So that reduces demand. All of our water fixtures are uh, low uh, flow. Uh, some of the toilets dual flush. Uh, you know, one button for less water, another button for more water. Um, all of our homes are gray water ready. So that's using sink, shower, bath water for irrigation. So instead of running sewer, it's used for irrigation. Now, in Los Angeles, it's still difficult to do gray water. They're working that out. Santa Monica, you can. Uh, my home was the first permitted home in LA County to have a gray water system, but it was a real pain in the butt to get that done. But apparently it's getting easier. But all of our homes are gray water ready. We think it's just a matter of time for all municipalities to allow it. Oh, and we, um, we encourage our clients to put in cisterns to collect rainwater to use for irrigation. Emissions. So this is an indoor air quality issue. So there's just there's more and more research that's suggesting that things like formaldehyde urea, which are uh, compounds that get off gas and the adhesives you find in millwork and in carpets, uh, uh, volatile organic compounds get off gas from paints and stains, mold, less of an issue here, but certainly in other parts of the country. More and more research is finding that those compounds are connected with skin and eye and head irritations, even some cancers. Uh, in Europe, phenomenon has been banned. So we do a lot to reduce indoor air pollution. Um, all of our uh, millwork is formaldehyde free. We have uh, fans. When we build over garages, we have fans that take out carbon monoxide before it seeps up into the house. And the fans in the bathroom on motion control, so when we walk in, the fan turns on so that there's less uh, likelihood for mildew, uh, which can cause mold in, in the wood we use in the bathrooms. Um, our fireplaces burn denatured alcohol, okay. so it's basically ethanol. There's zero smoke, almost no carbon, almost no pollution. Uh, they, um, many of our homes integrate indoor gardens. We actually found some cool research that NASA did on plants for space stations. We have plants that spider that filter indoor contaminants. 
and others that produce lots of oxygen more than the average plant. So that's part of the indoor air quality system, and it's cool by the way, just having plants inside. Okay. Um, to reduce carbon and waste, most of the materials we source are recycled or reclaimed or sustainably owned. So where we use steel, steel is the most recycled building material. It's basically all cars. Uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of steel is, is based on, on previously used steel. Uh, the wood we use um, generally is for stewardship council certified wood, FSC certified wood, so that's a nonprofit that certifies that wood is grown and harvested in a sustainable way. Our tiles are from recycled glass or mirrors. Um, we uh, use countertops made of osteocellulose, newsprint, or recycled glass and mirrors. Um, when we're building on a site with an existing property, we don't um, uh, we don't demo uh, that property. We deconstruct it. We have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity, so we have a, a house taken apart, and we've done this about five or six times. And in general, we've been able to salvage about seventy percent of the materials and the homeowner gets a tax deduction, so it's actually a pretty cool program. So one other thing we do that kind of cuts across a number of these categories, um, homes generally aren't designed to adapt to people's changing lifestyle needs. So uh, you're, um, you, you, you're single, you get married, you have some kids, if the in-laws move in, um, renovation is extremely expensive, stressful, and uh, very wasteful from a material standpoint. So we have some options, and these are options that everybody wants them. But things like movable walls that open and close for bedrooms so that you can open and close them as need be. Um, uh, internal space that you, where you can add floor and wall plates and expand space. And some of our homes even you can add rooms, just the bottom right uh, you're, you're seeing there. So these are things that, that we do that hopefully make our homes more adaptable to people's changing lifestyle needs, which not only is an environmental imperative, again, in those days, but also just great for our, 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 our home buyers because they have greater flexibility in their space. So I, I, um, I'm sure you carefully track that I only um, showed you five of the six C6s, zero water, zero waste, zero carbon, zero emissions, but um, you can do lots of things to um, reduce the ecological footprint of your home, but if people who live in that home aren't responsible about resource uses, um, they're going to use a lot of resources. So how do you reduce ignorance? So um, I, for a long time, had a, um, a Prius, of course. Um, I now have a Volt, of course. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, what many of the hybrid manufacturers have done, which is very cool, is they have a a, um, a screen that shows you in real time or over a period of time what your gas mileage is. And any system with feedback tends to improve. It becomes like a video game. And, 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 and us pre-I owners would like compare our mileage. And we know what to attempt because it tells us. And so it changes your driving habits because you want that number to be as big as possible, i.e. your mileage to be as great as possible. So, I figured we should have one for our home. So I actually found this company, and oh, I, I personally invested in it. And um, we work with them to do a, a system for our homes that shows you what your energy use and water use are um, in real time, it's net based, so you can see. So it's kind of cool. Actually, you can, if you're away from home, you can see if the kids are having parties uh, <laughs> by energy use. Um, so, um, so it has that double purpose too. So uh, this is a, a, a one of the things we do to reduce ignorance, to give people feedback about their energy and resource use. So um, I'm going to uh, show you, um, make a couple plugs, and then we're going to switch in a second to go online, um, which I'm going to show you today. So as I mentioned, we are going to be at Dwell showing our new home right in the middle of the convention center. So if you use say five, you can get a discount ticket. That's at dwell at dwellondesign.com. And there's a lot of other cool stuff. I'm going to highly recommend you, you, you going if, if you're into modern design, modern furniture, modern architecture, modern uh, art. Um, I mentioned also the open house. There'll be information on our site about that. 
and that's my contact info. Um, and uh, let's, oh, one other thing I should mention, we're doing our first small lot development in uh, Atwater Village, so we're doing eight single family homes in a retail space. We're gonna start to do more and more development, so hopefully some of your clients will be interested in that. That'll, that'll be done early next year. Um, if we can switch to the uh, web one last time, I'd appreciate it. So I'm just going to show you, um, we do both standard homes and we do custom floor plans. So to see the standard homes, go to homes and you can select a home, for example, uh, this is the Ray Cathy home based on, on, on my home. And you can configure it like a car. So um, you can pick different finishes and fixtures. So we'll start with the um, cladding.